Welcome to the Between Two Wheels podcast, where we talk about all things on and between two wheels. I'm your host, Johnny Roblox, and you all know my co-host, Uncle I Am Not an Asshole, You Just Suck, Ken, and special guest, Justin Takes Shots at Me All the Time, Now It's My Turn, Hasso. This episode is being brought to you by Get Lowered Cycles, your one-stop shop for all things Harley and Harley-related, and Nutsack, the last EC bag you will ever want or need. On today's episode, we are breaking down the specs of the top 1,000cc and larger sport bikes. Did you know you can win color match stretch saddlebags for your Harley? No? Head over to BetweenTwoWheels.com. The two is spelled out T-W-O. Click on the Project Clean Slate link and check it out. Advin Black has hooked us up with a set of bags to raffle off to help us raise money for Project Clean Slate, where we get a Harley, customize the hell out of it, and give it away to a veteran. Here's the bonus. With Between Two Wheels becoming a 501c3 nonprofit organization, you get to write off your donation on your taxes as charitable giving. So again, head over to BetweenTwoWheels.com, the two spelled out TWO, and check it out today. What's going on, guys? What's up? Welcome, Hasso. Hello. He's already fucking up over there, dinging yeah. around and shit. Yeah, making noise. So sensitive. Oh, damn. So Justin couldn't be with us today because he had a tummy ache. Yeah. So for the next two episodes, we have the Hasso. Yep. We'll see how it goes. Yeah. We, we may just shut off his mic. Yeah. Yeah. No one will never know. No, no. No one will tell him. <laughs> It'll just be some random guy in the video who's just sitting there with headphones on looking at the microphone. His lips will move. Yeah. <laughs> but we'll just cut all his voice out. We'll, we'll, we'll voice over. <laughs> yeah. We'll have, we'll have Justin do a voice over. There we go. Oh, there we God. go. <laughs> Uh, so a spec sheet shootout. Now we've done this a couple of times now. Uh, what ABV bikes mm-hmm. and some other, but roguelike killers, kind of. Yeah, yeah. Looking at the various fixed wing fairing bike, fixed fairing bikes. But we've had a lot of our listeners and viewers ask for a spec sheet specific leader bike yep. shootout for the sport bike. So here is this episode. So. Here are the areas we're going to be looking at and going over when we're looking at the following specs to help us determine which bike is the best. So we're going to go over the the actual header and then a brief definition. So top speed. If you don't know what this is, this is the speed in which 99.9% of these motorcycle owners will never see their speedometer reach. Fact. <laughs> well, well, you know, you know, that's not completely untrue because a lot of nowadays when you turn the ignition on, oh, it'll go all the way. It up. goes all the way yep. up and back down. So, I yeah. mean, hey, at least once a day, right? You know, or whenever they ride it, there you go. <laughs> yeah, um, horsepower and not torque. So, why torque propels the bike from the start? So, bottom end of the RPM range. Horsepower picks up and continues to push the bike faster also known as the top end of the RPM range. Horsepower is how fast you hit the wall. Torque is how far you push it. Fact. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, With sport bikes being high revving, it makes sense for the engineers to look for ways to increase the bike's horsepower performance. The torque on the sport bikes is less important due to the lighter weight of these bikes. Uh, With that being said, that is why you see the cruisers rate their engines on torque instead of horsepower they're heavier yep. and they're lower revving the key to the cruisers needing a lot of torque is simply to get these beasts moving yeah so that's why we went that way we're also going to be looking at wheelbase and let me explain why wheelbase is ma- uh, matters a longer wheelbase is suited for straight distance riding where maneuverability is less of a concern that is why you want and typically see longer wheelbases on cruiser and touring motorcycles a shorter wheelbase is preferred when maneuverability is a requirement in the case of sport bikes you want a shorter wheelbase which allows you to flick the bike from side to side in switchbacks and tight s turns this is why we see track bikes with shorter wheelbases here's a prime example a drag bike is stretched out really far as it provides that much needed stability to go in a straight line and track bikes have shorter wheelbases because they are carving their way through turn after turn so all of the sport bike bros that are out there 
adding the longer swing arms on their bikes are actually killing one of the major aspects of sport bike performance. Oh, yeah. So here's a public service announcement. Stop putting extended swing arms on your bikes. It looks goofy, and it kills your ability to carve the canyons the way the bike was meant to. Now, there's a caveat to this. If you're building a drag bike, then stretch it out. Yeah. yeah. That's a big good idea then. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in the show notes, I have a link that explains the wheelbase situation. So it's not like I'm just making this shit up. Uh, I mean, you can't lie on the internet. True. That's why I added another internet link. Yeah. yeah. Uh, finally, we're going to be looking at the weight. Lighter is better on sport bikes. It's quite simple, really. That is why you see a power to weight ratio on a sport bike and not on cruisers. <laughs> uh, the other thing we're going to be talking about is price. And then our very famous, extremely subjective looks category. No, that's pretty objective. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, Ken, what are the bikes that we're going to be looking at today? Okay. So, I went with the, the top top brands. Mm -hmm. you know out there we didn't look at the hawk that you can buy off of ebay because well they don't make sport bikes as far as i know the hawk the hawk <clears throat> do you mean the kawasaki no there's actually a brand that you can get on amazon <laughs> that's what i was talking about <laughs> is it a chinesium oh it comes in a it comes crated to oh, you yeah. on oh, you amazon put it together and you put it together yourself nice yeah nice so it's a builder. There you go. I mean, and you technically build your own bike, so you can say built, not bought. I mean, because it's, I mean, either way, you got to buy parts to build a bike. So, I mean. Yeah. Yeah. Of yeah. course, you're not fabricating a carburetor. Yeah. But, uh, so I went with the, 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 the top brands. So, I mean, we had Ducati, Yamaha, Honda, Kawasaki, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And I went with their top leader bike. On so the super sport side. On the super sport side. Okay. So, if they had three models of 1000 cc plus i went with the biggest one unless it was like a very specific one-off edition like i think i forget it was, uh, kawasaki or maybe ducati or something like that they had like a hundred fifty thousand dollar oh yeah no bike uh, no the, the everyday the average person's not gonna buy that yeah the everyday bikes that are you can purchase that's yes. what you went with okay so you have the ducati how do you say that? I, I've always heard it Panigale. Panigale V4S, the Yamaha YZF R1, the Honda CBR 1000 RR, the Suzuki Hayabusa because Busa bro, <laughs> the BMW S1000 RR, and I'm shocked that this one made it on the list, but I'm glad it did. The Kawasaki Ninja H. Two. Yeah, I was. I didn't know what to go with there because, I mean, it's still. I mean, for the price, I mean, it's still within a lot of people's budgets. I mean, okay. it, I mean, it, it, realistically, it is. I mean, if you yeah. go buy a car, I mean, you're going to pay that much. But I didn't go with the uh, ZX14 mm -hmm. just because of the H2 being there. Okay. So I went with their top. Like I said, it's not a one-off bike. Yeah. It's it's, not, it is a production motorcycle. It's a production motorcycle. Matter of fact, one of my friends just freaking bought one for some damn reason. So according to Kent's, they sell these things as soon as they come in. Oh, I believe it. So it is a normally purchased bike. I, I don't I don't want to ride next to the people who are buying these things, though. <laughs> well, you're either young and dumb and have too much fucking money, or you're <laughs> older, wiser, and have too much fucking money. Yeah. Okay, so... Let's start with the top speeds. So we'll start on the top of our list. And if you go into the show notes, we have all of this prepared and a lot easier to read. But the Ducati came in top speed of 190 miles per hour. The R1, 182 miles per hour. The CBR 1000, 185. The Hayabusa, 194. The Beamer, 200 miles per hour. And then the H2, 209 miles per hour. Okay, let's let's start with this. I mean, that's, that's only a, a 20 mile per hour spread. Yeah. The slowest top speed is the R1 at 182 miles per hour. Yeah. That's redonkulous. Yeah. And these speeds are all what the factory claims. Sure. 
Sure. You know, these no, none of these were track numbers or anything like that. So okay. everything that I found is what is claimed mm-hmm. uh, or from dyno tests, you know, from different okay, cycle like, magazines. Okay. I tried to hit multiple websites to get my information. Okay. Kind of take an average spread. Yeah. Okay. So 182 being the slowest. 209. The slowest. 209 being um, high. I, I mean, damn. Now, outside of racetracks, where could you actually run the... So you have Bonneville. Yeah. You could run it there. Um, there's a lot of highways in Nevada, New Mexico, Arizona that are flat, straight. and you I mean, can, you'll get there within seconds. Yeah. So, I mean, it's possible. There's, so... You know, here in Texas, there's a tollway kind of bypass that starts at I-10 just east of San Antonio and goes all the way up around Austin. And I think it ends in like Pflugerville or Georgetown or yeah, something. Yeah, 130, right? Something like that. That's They actually did a speed camera test oh, yeah. on that road with a Bugatti. And the Bugatti has a higher top, in, uh, top speed than this, the H2. And... But they were able to test it at its top speed. Yeah. So if anyone wants to go and have an all-out opportunity to run their bike. It'll do it there. There you go. And it's only going to cost you about $25 to go up that road. Yeah. Uh, that's <laughs> if they get a picture. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's insane that the, these bikes are capable of doing this. Now, is there a governor type of situation like a rev limiter that would stop these bikes from going that speed from the factory man i don't know yeah never heard. What, what's that david i've never heard of that um particularly um yesterday i saw a video on i think it was the um the honda uh, but it was a brand new bike the guy was taking it out uh, for a test ride and he talked about hitting the governor on it um, i'm not sure if it was a mile limit or not but um, well it hmm. One of the ways they would do it is they'll have it in like sixth gear. It won't go above 10,000 RPMs or something like that. And that's how they'll govern the top end. But again, we all know you can hack those computers. Oh, yeah. Get a tuner. E- ECM or flash. Yeah. Okay. So let's move on to horsepower. Ducati coming in at 214 horsepower at the crank. So horsepower, I found most all of what I found. I was able to find them at the wheel. Okay. Now, uh, of course, I mean, depending on where they get their numbers from, Mm -hmm. what dyno they were on that day, what the temperature was, the humidity, and all those factors. Yeah. But most of these were claimed at the wheel. Okay. So, for at the crank, you had about 15 to 20%. Yeah. So Ducati, 214. The R1, 162.4. The CBR, 149.6. The Hayabusa, 167. The Beamer coming in at 148. And the H2 Ninja at 189. Jeez, it's hard to fathom that when you look at a Harley motor putting out like 80 on a good... Yeah. On, on like a, a decent motor, you're putting out 80 horsepower, and then you start seeing, you know, double well, that I mean, number. You know, the, 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 the Ducati with that 214, I think that's what my Kia makes. <laughs> 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 I've been really surprised um, looking at this information that you guys share with me because I'm you know, i really new when it comes to sport bikes and had no idea that this kind of performance is what they're capable of. So uh, just digging into YouTube a little bit, seeing some some information, um, and this is, I'm curious to know what that quick shift is. I was watching some guys, and he was, uh, this same video, where he was on the CBR 1000, and he was going, He I didn't see him hit the hit he, the clutch. He wasn't using, he, so he was using a GP quick shifter. Uh, what is that? And really, it, it's just, it's an additional part. <laughs> they cost like 300 bucks from what I've seen before, and... Once you were out of first gear, you don't need to use the clutch. Wow. Uh, and it it shifts for you. So also something to think about, even on your Harley, you can shift without your clutch 
if you have your RPMs high enough and you're moving, it's it's all about having your synchros okay. kind of aligned. And when you're going, you can feel just when you lift your, your foot up, it will just ease itself in. Yeah. And that is that is another form of quick shifting. Wow. Okay. So unlike with a car where you just slap something and it shifts for you, with these, it just it helps the bikes, it helps the transmission stay, the synchro stay aligned. Right. So, but yeah, it's it's nuts. But go ahead. I've never had an interest in the sport bike. I I love how they look. Um, I think they're, they're they're beautiful in their design. But um, to me, in my mind, unless you just wanted to go fast, um, I didn't see any value or, or fun in it for me. Um, but the performance and the technology that I see that comes along with these bikes is amazing. I mean, oh yeah, it's well. You know, I see a lot of people that that are into the the sport bike scene <clears throat> is they they like it for the ex, the aesthetics, mm-hmm. you know, and the, that that cool factor. Of, oh, I've got a motorcycle that can do two hundred miles an hour. Yeah, that definitely helps. You know, I mean, but you you watch them around town and guess what? They're they're doing the same shit at the same speed that yeah, I'm right. doing it on on my road glide. Yeah. Yeah, you can't take advantage of it, so I never saw the point in that. Well, in the city, no, yeah. but you go up to the hill country and you try to keep pace with those sport bikes. Oh, yeah. They're leaning a lot farther over than we can, and they're able to maintain that speed through the twisties. And yeah. it, it comes down to the whole, I want to push myself to my limit, knowing that the bike probably has more to go than I can give it. Yeah. I mean, when it comes down to it, like when you, like we had initially started looking at like lean angle mm-hmm. for, for this and I couldn't find anything you know not from the factory not from most uh, popular like cycle magazines and etc that were listing lean angles but I found one thing that said the lean angle generally for a street bike not a freaking GP racer is a 45 degrees is the max yeah for a street ridden sport bike yeah so when I when I was doing my research on my flight back from San Francisco, most of these bikes all have that forty five to forty seven degree. Yeah, so it's right there. Hasso, you're gonna just have to jump in. Ken and I like to talk. Well, I like listening to you guys too. So it's I'm, com- I'm conflicted over here. <laughs> um, <laughs> just glancing at the wheelbase and again, we're not there yet. Okay, I'll save it for slow, that. Slow down, slow <laughs> down. Jeez. I got so many questions. Um, talk about gas tanks now. If you're running a 100 plus 200 plus horsepower bike you're going to need a big gas tank or something right so ducati has a 4.23 gallon r1 4.5 cbr 4.2 hayabusa 5.5 the beamer 4.4 and the h2 is 4.5 really there's no difference not not much other than the hayabusa they're they're the staggering gap yeah i mean the the hayabusa comes in at a, at a gallon more than, than the rest of them. them yeah you know so it looks like they pretty much have a decent standard going i mean the gas mileage is you know of course stock bikes <laughs> off the showroom floor the, the gas mileage is all roughly the same as well yeah like I, we didn't include those but th- they're all roughly in that 40 50 yeah. mile range which i mean like i said it's pretty standard yeah so let's let's jump into weight. Now this is the wet weight. So this is all the fluids in the bike. Ducati comes in at 436 pounds. The R1 439. The CBR 452. The Hayabusa 586 pounds. The Beamer 450. And the H2 is 529. Now something that's interesting. Other than the Busa and the Ninja. They're all 1,000 cc ish bikes. The Boost is a 1,300, I believe. Yeah. And the H2 is just massive. So that could have something to do with the larger gas tank and the heavier weight. Oh it's yeah. Just a much bigger mill. You know when when I was so when I was putting this sheet together, I didn't realize that the Ninja weighed 530 pounds. Well, like I mean, looking at it. Just, yeah, it just looks it, like all the other ones. It looks like all the other ones, and you wouldn't think that it weighs nearly 100, 100 pounds. pounds more yeah. than, than the rest of them. <laughs> I mean, you look at the Busa, and the Busa is a big fucking bike. Yeah. You know, 
But then you look at the H2 and you're like, it doesn't look that big. Yeah. And that's a current weight. Yeah. For yeah. the H2 because I'm curious because it has that one, that single uh, swing arm set up mm -hmm. on the 20 that I saw. So uh, most of day. these are 2019s. Okay. Yeah. It was a 19 or a 20 and the Ninja H2 and uh, Panigale had the same setup with the single sidearm and I, I love the way that looked. Oh yeah. Oh, it looks wheel. clean. Yeah. 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 Aesthetically that looks fantastic. So missing a piece like that of the frame, you know, part of the frame and still carries that much weight. Oh yeah. Well, but so that's kind of a misnomer because that single swing arm is twice as thick as it would be if it was a right. dual Makes because sense. they have to make it more rigid. Rigid, right. All right. Let's jump into the wheelbase. Again, shorter wheelbase is better here. Uh, Ducati, 57.8 inches. The R1, 55.3. The CBR, 55.3. The Busa, 58.3. The Beamer, 56.7. And the Ninja coming in at 57.3. So we haven't really gone over too, min too much of who's winning and who's losing. We're going to go over that after we uh, get to the price. But it's interesting to see that the wheelbases are pretty tight. Oh, yeah. And that's what 57 or 58 to, to 55. 55. Yeah, three inch three difference. Inch. Yeah, 2. Yeah. Five inch difference. So <laughs> it's minimal. But all of the YouTube videos I was watching about this that two inches makes a difference and i it really can and it, it to maybe the normal street rider it probably won't are we are we talking about motorcycles yeah. <laughs> well justin ain't here so <laughs> oh. yeah two, two oh, inches goes a long way man <laughs> um but yeah so it's it's just it's funny to see that um but yeah the the longest wheelbase is the busa so it's kind of cool. I don't know. Let's go into the final thing before we go into the winners and losers, before we add our uh, subjective looks category price tag. The Ducati is a Ducati, therefore you're paying for it. It is $24,000. The R1 is 16000 The CBR, 16000 The Busa, 14000 The Beamer, 16000 and the ninja coming in just under thirty thousand. Yeah. So in all these prices were baseline prices. Yeah, the starting the price. Starting price for all of them didn't include any extras you could add. Yeah. All right. So when we come back from Nutsack, we're gonna go over who the winners and the losers are for each of the categories, and then we're gonna go into our purely judgmental looks category. Nutsack is the only EDC bag the crew carries, and for good reason. They're crazy and awesome. They get their name because folks said they had to be nuts to manufacture a man bag in America with American waxed canvas, American leather, and American labor. We want you to join us in the two-week challenge. Buy a bag from them, use it for two weeks, and if it doesn't completely change the way you carry your everyday gear, they will give you a full refund. We absolutely love ours from carrying a Around extra mags for our concealed carry to earbuds sunglasses vape stuff and business cards it is great having less shit in our pockets and it was because of the nutsack satchels that we were able to be less weighed down if you buy using our link nutsack will give you five dollars off to enjoy a beer head over to nutsack.com slash b2w that's n-u-t-s-a-c dot com slash be the number two w to get yours today and we are back so can walk us through the winners of top speed and horsepower <clears throat> so top speed the the ninja h2 yeah nailed it by 27 miles an hour yeah from from the bottom yeah to the top that's a 27 mile an hour spread <laughs> I mean, 209 miles an hour. I can't fathom that in any vehicle. I've never gone that speed outside of an airplane. <laughs> My top speed's 160-ish. My top speed's 130. On a bike? Yeah, yeah, on a bike. And that was when I had my uh, Katana in Montana. So that was on my Softail. I had uh, my mechanic, Brian Todd, out of Dallas. He had built that motor. 
we had to we went through three clutches because of how powerful the motor was and we finally got a locker clutch in there it was 3 a.m blasting north on 75 and i was just just seeing what it could do i my speedometer stopped at like 85 but my gps just kept on ticking up ticking up ticking up and i get underneath telephone road and 75 and all of a sudden red and blue lights come on i was like fuck hit the hazards and i'm coasting to a stop i was like i'm not going to kill my brakes on this one no so i coasted he could see i was stopping so he he wasn't getting too antsy and i pull over in a nice safe area for both of us and he gets off or he gets out of his car and he's like i can't write you a ticket i'm thinking to myself wait what I'm not going to jail. So he comes up to me. He's like, look, if you were on a V rod or if you were on a sport bike, I'd give you a ticket right now. But if I write this up as a soft tail going that speed, no one would believe me. So two questions, where did you get it done? And how much was it? <laughs> I heard from Brian like a month later that that cop came in and got the exact engine package put in his bike. Nice. I'm like, damn, he got put into a road king. <laughs> Ooh, a road king. That'd be nice. Yeah. But it was it was stupid fast. I hit a bump and my handlebars were free floating. Yeah, pass. Yeah. I I never want to go that fast again. So when I hit one thirty, I was the middle of the day. I just took the bike out for a ride and hit one of the roads coming out of Great Falls. I saw a cop parked on the side of the road. Great Falls, Montana? Yes. Okay. And I passed him, and I was like, okay, he's probably going to be sitting there for a while. So I chanced it, and I turned around up ahead. And, of course, it's a sport bike. So you get fast in, yeah. in no time flat. And at 130, I, I mean, I was full tuck and felt like I was floating. Yeah. And at that point, I realized I'm going way too fast. <laughs> yeah. And you were in the military at the time still. Yeah. Okay, so you're still six foot four. Yeah. Probably a lot lighter weight. About about 250 okay 225 or so yeah so a full tuck is not the same as if hasa was in a full tuck <laughs> no he he could actually just sit behind the fairing oh, and yeah. be fine yeah and that's exactly right this might come as a surprise to you guys but my fastest speed is of course chasing you guys um <laughs> oh, somewhere so. between 100 and 110 i believe um before i got too afraid to take my eyes off the road of course this was somewhere in mexico yeah just, uh, yeah uh, disclaimer right there um we were allegedly going that allegedly. fast yeah somewhere in mexico um <laughs> but yeah I, I know exactly what you mean about the tuck uh you just get behind the fairing and yeah it pretty much covers me up pretty good but um and i would have i enjoy going fast like i said it might be surprising but what the obstacle factor or the uncontrolled environment is what scares me of course oh yeah oh yeah definitely 100 you know, I, I would say that you know, I have no problem going fast, you know, especially in a straight line. My only fears, really, like I don't worry about deer no. or, or, you know, a dog or a cat or something like that running out in the road. Here in San, and it's from being here in San Antonio, mm -hmm. is uh, is ladders. Yeah. Do you know how many Shit fucking ladders? flying out of the yes. back of trucks. Are on the fucking road. <laughs> yeah, like debris. I could, I could not yeah. imagine, you know hitting a ladder like I, yeah i see debris on the side of the road all the time but i see a lot of damn ladders yeah like how the fuck do you lose a 26 foot extension ladder like or a mattress or I mean, a mattress yeah you can roll through a mattress though <laughs> yeah ladder not yeah. it's, it's oh. gonna it's gonna hurt oh my god so me and a buddy were up in eureka springs and we were riding the pig trail having fun and it was it was getting late and it doesn't matter where in eureka springs you're riding when it's dark, you're going through twisties. Yep. And we were going at a pretty good clip. I would say maybe 100-ish. And he was on a sport bike. He was on a Ninja. And <laughs> we didn't see it until it was too late. And I was probably five bikes behind him. He split a dog. Oof. A dog came out right in front of him. He went right down the middle. Oh and I mean, I felt terrible that that dog is now gone. But when we get we got into eureka springs we went to a you know one of those quarter uh car washes and he had a full leather riding suit that at the time was white Ugh. Oh, and his bike God. was white Ugh. 
and we get there. It looks like he just committed a Dexter scene, uh, uh, just blood wretched. and shit all over him. Wretched. And it, I mean, we just, I, I hosed him down. <laughs> Tommy boy uh, style. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it was, it was crazy, but okay. So we went through top speed and let's go th- horsepower. So, I mean, top horsepower went surprisingly it, for me mm-hmm. uh, to the Ducati. Okay. 214 horsepower. And the bottom of that was the BMW with 148. Yeah. And there's, uh, outside of like the Beamer and the CBR, they're about the same, 148 to 149.6. Yeah. And then you get the Hayabusa and the R1, which is within five. Yeah. You know, 162 for the R1 and 167 for the Busa. It kind of makes you think, though, the Busa should be producing more numbers it has the same, you know, red line around 13,000, 14,000 RPMs, but it's a much larger motor. Well, yeah, and it weighs nearly 100 pounds more. Yeah, so why, I don't know, maybe they had to sacrifice the horsepower to get some of the torque. It may be so. You know, a longer stroke creates that. So, I, okay, I can I, I can understand it. But, yeah, when I was looking at these numbers... And then you, when you start looking at the horsepower and the top speed, mm-hmm. you know, top speed went to the Ninja, horsepower went to the Ducati, you know, but the Ducati's a full 19 miles an hour slower yeah. than the H2 and has, shit, uh, 25 more horsepower. Math. Yeah, math is hard sometimes, <laughs> but I did it. Yeah. There you go. In your head. <laughs> In my head, he even. Didn't, just so y'all know, if you're not even, watching the video, he did not use his fingers. Didn't even count on my fingers, goddamn. <laughs> but, but yeah, no, I mean, you know, the the Hayabusa was the fastest production sport bike on the market forever. Yeah, for a long time. And then the ZX-14 came out. And then the H2. And the ZX-14 really only eked out a win. Yeah. It was not like a blowing them out of the water. Right. But then of course they brought out the H2. <laughs> and they said fuck you. And <laughs> and of course this is this is the this is the production H2 that anybody can buy, not the H2R yeah. that is a track model only, which I think is even faster. Yeah, I don't I didn't even look at the specs on that one. I, I didn't of, either because yeah. you can't buy it unless you're a, a racer. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let's skip gas tank and weight because well, who cares? Yeah. Um wheelbase. Hasso. Um, it makes sense. Um, obviously, these manufacturers are going to design the bike to perform. But um, in the show notes, when you pointed out how people are adjusting their wheelbase and extending it, I mean, do you think that's just lack of knowledge or they don't care about, um, you know, reducing the performance and handling on their bikes? Or just I books? honestly think it is all looks for them. Purely aesthetic. And yeah. they're not the ones who are trying to tweak every ounce of performance out of their motorcycle to go hit the the twisties no those those guys the the guys that extend their swing arms if they're not on a track then they're doing it either for aesthetics or because they want to be the fastest in a straight line from a stoplight yeah i don't see the point <laughs> buying something a machine like that um i'm a stickler for oem things in, in that regard and mm-hmm. coming down when it comes out to performance and and just things like that. Um, if it's not helping, I don't. I don't see the point. In but I, I think a lot of it too is they don't know that it's hindering their their bike. Well, we'll just look at it next time. Next time we go to a bike event, and you see the sport bikes out there because they're the only ones that extend their swing arms, obviously. Because if you're on a cruiser, you put the big fat tire on it. Yeah. That's really the thing. But <laughs> look at them and trying to do a U turn. Oh, yeah. In a standard American street. <laughs> they only need three lanes. They, they can't. <laughs> I'll admit it looks cool. And that's obviously the it reason why cool they do it. It looks cool for a trailer queen but, but I, or I, a drag bike. Yeah. I mean, well, then you get the guys that, you know, they'll, they'll, go, they'll dark side it with an extended swing arm. And mm-hmm. then it makes you wonder, like, okay, he, he put a car tire on the back of it. Dark siding, for those who don't know, is when you put a car tire on your rear tire. And if if you see someone with uh, with an, a stretch swing arm and a regular motorcycle tire, they ain't doing shit. Yeah. If you see someone with a stretch swing arm and a car tire on the back, they going fast as fuck most likely. Yeah. 
or, most likely. Or they have more money than sense. This is true. Yeah. There's a whole road glide uh, debate right now, people wanting to dark side their road glides. And I'm like, I, it, for what? I, I don't know. It kills your cornering. Yeah. I mean, I guess if you were. Y- you don't need a kickstand. Yeah, I mean, guess depending on what size rear tire you get, yeah. you wouldn't need a kickstand. Go with like an eight-inch wheel with the uh, car tire on there. It's got a nice flat patch that you can just stand your bike up, no kickstand needed. Yeah, I mean, I hear people that that swear by it, but they're like, "Oh, I get fifty thousand miles out of my rear tire." Well, no shit, it's a fucking car tire. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know? So since Hasso completely dropped the ball on this one, the winner of the wheelbase challenge is actually a tie between the R one. And the CBR 1000 R. The loser is the Hayabusa. So we have 55.3 inches as the shortest wheelbase, 58.3. So again, about a three inch difference. Yeah, that's that's really nothing. Yeah, that's almost insignificant. Yeah. Now price. <laughs> so the Busa wins by two thousand dollars. It's fourteen grand. That's the lowest. Then we have three bikes stacked up at 16000 So the R1, the CBR1000 RR, and the Beamer, all of them base price is sixteen. Yeah, entry prices. And then the Ninja has the the highest cost, which makes sense, at 29000 Now, let's go into looks. <laughs> uh, now, this is purely subjective, and... For the listeners and the viewers, if you want to go to the show notes, I have links in the show notes to the Google searches for each of these bikes. So you can kind of get an understanding of what we looked at when we came up with our ratings. So, Ken, Ducati, what do you think? I give it a five. Okay. Out of five. No, out of ten. The looks is one to five, buddy. Oh, fuck. I dicked that all up in mine's. Okay, so you gave it a, a two and a half. Two and a half, yeah. Okay. I gave it a three. I, I, here's the thing. I don't like Ducati. They, they yeah, yeah. are the Harley Davidson of the sport bike world. They, they claim a premium price point, but they don't, they don't live up to it. They you don't know, perform. I, I, I can get behind that statement. Yeah. Th- I mean, they used to. They used to be a very high performance machine that won all the races for like a year or two, and then their prices skyrocket. And I get it; it's an Italian sport bike, but damn. I mean, and you know, and 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 you saying that that it's the the Harley of the sport bike world in in essence is when you look at it, twenty four thousand dollars for their top bike, mm-hmm. top super sport bike, and. I mean... It only won two categories. It, well, yeah, I mean, it only won two categories. But when you compare it to the rest of what you can get... Yeah. <clears throat> when, you know, you're looking at only a 20-mile-an-hour difference, you know, horsepower, you know, is within 30, 40. Just, there's nothing outstanding there. No. You're, you're paying for that Ducati name... Yeah. Because it's an Italian bike. Yeah. You know, and and that's what they're... That's what they're showboating. Yeah. And I think the biggest competition in Italy for Ducati is Aprilia. And the Aprilias actually have some very outstanding performing bikes oh, yeah. at a much lower cost. So I look at that. Um, Hasa, what do you think? I agree with Justin. I, I give it a four out of five. Um, I saw a couple of variations and just color and um, color scheme, mm-hmm. and I really liked it. You know, Especially, like I mentioned, with that single... Um, Single swing, swing arm, on. and you can expose and, and show off the wheel. And there was some impressive wheels on the one, one of the bikes I was looking at. So, um, I like the four on that one. Okay, so again, this is a rating of one to five. So, if we look at it from a percentage standpoint, Justin, who filled this out before he came, you know, before he got sick, uh, he gave it an eighty percent or a four out of five. Ken gave it a 50%, and I gave it a 60%. Yamaha, I gave this one a 3 for the R1. And the reason is because, and we're going to go into this, but I'm going to go ahead and just, you know, spill the beans now. All these bikes look the same to me. You know, so my, 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 
my looks scoring will reflect exactly that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, we talked about this just a little bit before we came in here. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, two and a half. Yeah. Right, right in the middle. Yeah. Nothing, nothing spectacular about it. Yeah. Hasa? Yeah, I kind of feel the same um, in the Yamaha. For me, out of this list, I give it probably a three, um, just comparing yeah. the looks. Um, but again, it's, like Hans said, it's just, they're almost the same to me, but a few differences. Um, mostly in the, the front fairing, the way it was shaped, I wasn't feeling it. So Yeah. So, you know, we made the comment off air that if you strip down all the fairings off of these bikes and you put the same fairing on every one of them, you wouldn't really be able to tell the difference. Now I'm betting the guys and girls who are 100% sport bike enthusiasts could pick it out by based on looking at the motor or something or the exhaust, the yeah. exhaust note, you know, though they can look at that and understand it. But as cruiser guys, it's hard for me to differentiate. And I'm betting the same could be said about us. You know, the Honda Shadow and, you know, the, the Soft Dino, Tail, the whatever. Freaking Sportster. They all look the same. Yeah. And, but for us, we can look at it and it's like, no, 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 no. There's a radiator on that one. Therefore, it's, yeah, this it's, model. It's a metric. Yeah. Or the, you know, the, the final drive is on the right side. Yeah. So it's to the left. So it's, it's a Sportster. Left, so it's definitely a Sportster. Yeah. yeah. So looking at that, it is what it is. Uh, but, I just think the, especially the Yamaha, the Honda, and not the Hayabusa, but like the Jixer, they all look very similar. And I yeah. get, too, that there's a reason for that. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, well, look at the truck market. Yeah, they all look relatively the they same. They all have that, you know, kind of muscly, you know, Dodge. I think it was Dodge that really came out with that, the bubbled muscle yeah. kind of looking front end. Yeah. And then what did everyone do after that? They followed suit. They followed suit. Yeah. It sells. Well, I think in here it comes down to the aerodynamics. There's a reason they make all these bikes very similar. It's cutting through the wind. It's creating the right amount of drag, and it's creating an airflow that goes over the rider yeah, in well, a specific way. Well, and all these motorcycles were designed for racing. Yeah. You know, so they literally take the racing aspect of it and just put it in a street model. Yeah. Or they just make a damn race bike and then, oh, well, fuck it. Let's sell it <laughs> as a street bike as well. Yeah. Um, so to get through these a little bit quicker, I think the let's just go with our favorite. That's Because <laughs> they're all pretty much rated the same. There's one or two that are a little bit off. So, Ken, what is your favorite looking bike? So like, like we said, you strip them all down, you put all the same things on, they're all going to look the same. But... As they sit on the showroom floor, uh, I, I rated most of them right in the middle, mm -hmm. two and a half. All right. I rated the Busa just a little lower because I'm tired of fucking seeing it. You know? Well, you know, they, they had killed the model, and now they're... Well, they, they killed it for what? A, a week? Well, they announced it that they the EPA or the U.S. government is going to yeah. let them sell out their current stock. Yeah. And, and then, then they just fixed it and they said fuck it we're going to redesign it and, yeah. bring, and keep it because a lot of people really like the Busa. They do. I mean and you you see them all over the place and you know there's a lot of real estate on it to paint. Yeah. They're great show bikes. Yeah. But they do perform. And they, they, and they absolutely do perform. They are fast as fuck. And at 14k you're yeah. getting a hell of a super bike. Oh you're getting a big fucking big fast fucking bike. Yeah. Yeah. So but my top pick was the Ninja H2. Mm-hmm. And the reason I picked that, I gave that, well, of course, I was doing mine out of 10. I gave it a 7 out of 10. Uh, so what, a 4? <laughs> 4 out of 5? Yeah. Uh, looking at it, it looks different. There is a lot of aesthetics mm -hmm. and, and design that went into that. And I realized that that came from their race model. Yeah. You know, so the little, your little wings up front. Yeah, or, you know, near your mirrors, like all those little things changes the entire look of yeah. the bike. It's very aggressive looking. It's almost transformer esque. Yeah, looking. Well, fuck for thirty thousand dollars, it better look amazing. Oh yeah, and, and it it absolutely stands out. Yeah, you know one when you see one. Yeah, usually because all the biker bros and biker sisters. Yeah, I'll go that way. 
biker sisters are yeah. look they know what that bike is yeah they 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 know it because that's oh, yeah. that was on the cover of like every major motorcycle oh, publication absolutely when it came out because it was something new something fresh yeah well now they have two yeah. per, you know civilian models yeah uh which i didn't even you know put it on the list just yeah and it's still a thousand cc plus bike yeah it's still an h2 <laughs> but i i think it, overall i mean it only took one category and that was the top speed mm-hmm. but none of its numbers are terrible by any means well none of these well, bikes it, have terrible it, numbers it only lost in the price category yeah it, it was it was within the standard range yeah of every other category except for top speed where it clearly won oh yeah and you could literally buy two hayabusas for the cost of one of these yeah yeah <laughs> all right hasa what is your favorite bike yeah, I agree with Ken. The Ninja H2 to me is the sexiest bike. Um, I really liked it. If um, you know, growing up, when I noticed these sport bikes, the Ninja was was the cool sport bike. So, oh yeah, Ninja was. Yeah, Ninja was the one. Wasn't the, wasn't it, wasn't it a Ninja that uh, Tom Cruise rides in Top Gun? Good question. I don't know. I try hard not to think about that. But Come on, the new Top Gun movie's coming out. I you gotta see it. Can't wait. Oh yeah, I'm gonna definitely see it. I'm a, I'm a Navy guy, <laughs> but um, I think so. I think it was a Ninja. Yeah. So my favorite was kind of a tie. Not, it doesn't really mark, isn't, I kind of fat fingered it, but it's between the Busa and the H2. I like the Busa. I like that goofy little hump in the back. Um, I call it the nut, nut catcher. <laughs> um, so when you're flying off your bike, that's what's going to catch you and make you uh, talk in falsetto. But I just I love the curves of that bike, and you know it is a Busa. Oh yeah, I mean there's it's another iconic yeah bike. They I I have to hand it to Suzuki. They have only refined the sh- the fairings of that. They haven't changed it. No, and yeah. I I can appreciate that. The H2 is sexy as fuck. Period. Yeah. And I definitely like the way it looks. None of these bikes I would personally ride for a long period of time just because I'm, I don't see myself being comfortable on them. But looking at them, I, I would I would take both the Busa or the H2 from a, a purely aesthetic value. Yeah. Well, see, when I, was buying, when I was buying my motorcycle, I was looking at either the Road Glide or a Busa or ZX-14. Yeah. All right. So to wrap up the episode, today's closing argument has nothing at all to do with sport bikes. According to the industry, so the helmet manufacturers, they say you should change your helmet every five years unless you wreck or you drop your helmet. In your opinion, when should you replace your helmet? Oh, Hasso. Oh, man. When you get tired of it. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> I want to look different. So um, I, I just officially bought my third helmet, you know, for the dual sport. Um, Wait, you bought three helmets just for your dual sport? <laughs> no, as I've been riding since. Oh, okay, okay, right? okay. Um, I did the noob thing, bought a used helmet, which I know better now, um, just to get started, to take training. Um, and then I moved into what you've seen the... Um, the Harley Davidson helmet that I have. I think yeah. it's a, made by HJC. Yeah, your fanboy helmet. Right. Um, but the reason I went with that helmet is, well, I like the graphics, um, and the price point wasn't terrible. But uh, just comparing that between um, the other one, um, quite a bit of noise. So I'm looking for a new one. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think we've gone through, you guys have gone through a few um, well, makes but, and models. Mm-hmm. But, but that's different, though. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But I, I haven't gotten there yet in terms of when you should do it primarily. But um, do you buy the five years or dropping your helmet, that type of thing? The the time period on it, you know, it makes sense. Uh, but what really surprised me was the drop, you know. And as I've heard from Harley, you know, if you buy a helmet online or even if you take it out of store, they won't take it back because of that risk factor there. So that was surprising, but it makes sense. Um, I'd say just I'm the type of person that likes to have something current 
Mm-hmm. So um, if the manufacturer says five years, well, five years does seem like a long time. It, it does seem like yeah. a yeah. really long time. I would probably do it much before that, you know. So Ken? So for me, uh, I've gone through several helmets, and that part of it is just finding a helmet that I like better, mm-hmm. more comfortable, quieter, has better field of view, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the whole five-year thing, I, th- I really honestly thought it was more like three years. Yeah. yeah uh, co- according to um, Cycle World magazine or something like that when I was reading – um, and then I, I did some cross-reference, and the average is five years. Man, I would... Do you know why that is? I would have to say that, you know, that five years has to be based on how often you wear your helmet. Obviously, where mm-hmm. in the country you live to, to, to wear your helmet. Like, down here in Texas... You're not going to make it five years. No. Because I mean, you sweat too much. You sweat so much. And, right. and of course, and then the heat, depending on where you store your helmet. You know, even if you leave it on your bike, you know, when you go in the store, mm-hmm. you come back out and your helmet's already 110 degrees. Yeah. Especially if you have a black helmet. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So uh, the reason for the five-year mark is because of the breakdown of the EPS. Yeah. Your, your sweat, the oils in yep. your skin and... All of that. And then... When you wreck, a helmet is a one-time use yeah. accessory. Well, that's why insurance companies typically don't cover them. Well, so on the few accidents I've had, my helmet's been replaced by the insurance company each time. Now, it wasn't my insurance company. It oh, yeah. was the other parties. But is it, And how does that work when you file a claim against your wife? <laughs> so I found out that for bodily injury, that there is a cap in Texas <laughs> oh, if someone right. in your household hits you. Yeah, that's right. You told me that. So it, it caps at $30,000. Yeah. Uh, my medical bills were somehow more than $30,000. Um, but that's that's for another time and another <laughs> day. Uh, but I change my helmet almost annually. And don't you dare fucking say it every time he buys a new bike. No, assholes. I thought it was every time he sweat. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, okay, since I said it, since I got this Road Glide, yeah. I've had four helmets. Well, I bought one of your helmets. Yeah. you didn't. It didn't fit right. Right. And mm. Get Lowered was super cool about it, but it was just easier for me to sell it to you. And you got a good deal on it. Yeah. And I didn't have to mess around with trying to ship it back and doing all that. So that made sense. But I have found my favorite helmet. Really? Yeah. That Simpson uh, Modular Bandit. And for a modular helmet, it is not that loud. I've had a lot of okay. modulars. Yeah, that's one you bought at the uh, Giddy Up, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I got it at half the cost because it was... I, oh, it's cosmetically flawed. Yeah. Yes. Where? I, I, I still can't find it. <laughs> but I do love it. The only thing I wish, it, it wasn't black. Yeah. I don't like black helmets, even though 99% of my helmets are black. But I, I would prefer to get that one painted. Yeah. Paint it white, maybe even color match my bike, just to be that guy. Yeah. We we know we know a garage that'll do that for you. Yeah, I mean they could put like Michael Scott or something like that on the back of it. Yeah, um, Fast Life. Uh, yeah, those guys. If you guys don't know about Fast Life Garage, they have a podcast. Um, go check them out. But the shop itself, the paint work they do, their helmet painting just blows yeah, my fucking mind. Is amazing, amazing work. So be sure to go check them out. I'll put a link to their website or Instagrams or I'll put a bunch of their shit on the show notes for this. Yeah, I mean, I replaced mine. I've I've gone through three or four helmets now. Yeah, and it's just finding you know a better one. Like the first helmet I bought was just a cheap uh, HJC modular C Max two or something like that. It was eighty dollars. Yeah, you know, and now I'm buying helmets up in the two hundred and three hundred dollar range. Right. You know, because in helmets you really do get what you pay for. Yep. Yeah, and the whole drop thing, helmets. Now DOT standards. This is not ECE or anything like that or Snell. <clears throat> Dot standards only test the helmet at a drop with a eight pound weight in it, I believe, eight or ten pound, you know, to average human average head. human head weight from six feet. So if you drop your empty helmet anything less than six feet, it should be fine. 
I mean, technically speaking, it should be. I mean, I've dropped my helmet off my motorcycle, off the seat of my motorcycle. Yeah. I just look forward. You can tell quickly, especially if it's got a fiberglass um, outer shell. If you see a crack, it's done. replace it. It's done. If you don't see a crack, it's just got a little... If your foam is cracked, yeah, it's it's done. My only concern with this time frame recommendation is what do you base it off of? When the helmet was manufactured or when you bought yes, it? Yes, when the helmet was right. technically... But how it's many from people? when the helmet was manufactured. It's like your car tires. Well, right so there. a helmet warranty, and there are warranties on every helmet. That it's one year from the day you buy it. Yeah. What that boils down to when you purchase it, because in my case, the helmet I currently own, it was like a year or so since it was manufactured when I purchased it. So you lose a year there if you're going to base it. Yeah. Off and, of and, and it all depends on where it was being stored at. Was it stored right. in, in an un, yeah. you know, a, a climate controlled warehouse or not? Yeah, I, I think you just use your best judgment. Yeah, you know? yeah, and I can't keep a helmet long enough for it to even get close to five years. Look, I think I've only I had my uh, my Bell qualifier for the longest, and I washed those pads once when they finally got nasty enough. Yeah, and then I ended up, but then I ended up buying the helmet from you. Yeah, so I think really, you know, stay within the manufacturer suggested time frame, right. but but also use your head, right. <laughs> I mean, which for a lot of people is hard. Yeah. Because, I mean, it's it's hard to, to some people to justify spending even $100 for, for some things. Yes. Yeah. How much is your brain worth, right? We're, yeah. So I mean. You got to remember that. In yeah. If, if you're if you're over 60, who cares, right? I mean, you, yeah. You probably want to die instead of having to deal with the recovery. Oh, man. You get one of those dot approved uh, bandanas or hats. Oh, and yeah. the baseball caps. Yeah. 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 Dot approved baseball caps. Or no, wait, the baseball caps are snow rated. Oh, yeah. Okay. Thank you for tuning in to Between Two Wheels podcast. To see the show notes for this and all of our episodes, to find links to our social media and Patreon page where we are raising money for Project Clean Slate, head over to our website at www.betweentwowheels.com. The two is spelled out T-W-O. On behalf of Justin, Uncle Ken, I am Johnny Roblox saying, be yourself unless you're a jerk. Then be someone better. Peace. Uh, 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 yeah.